Hello and a very warm welcome to the Institute for Government for this event on how can Ombud schemes be reformed. I'm Matthew Gill. Uh, we'd like to thank the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman for kindly supporting this event. Uh, before we get, begin, just some brief housekeeping arrangements. We'll be tweeting uh, from IFG events uh, using the hashtag IFG Ombuds. So please do follow and tweet along. If you're watching online, uh, do send in your questions as soon as you like on the panel to the left of your screen uh, and um, we'll, we'll see those and bring them into the conversation. For those in the room, there'll be a microphone uh, that, that, that moves around during the Q&A portion of the event, so do have a think about what questions you might like to ask. And we'll have a video and sound recording of this event on our website um, shortly after it finishes. Ombud schemes enable citizens to complain about the services they receive. Their work not only resolves individual cases, but also informs public service improvements and reform. The public service ombud system in England, and for reserved UK matters, relies on legislation that dates from 50 years ago. There's been widespread consensus on the need for reform for at least two decades, but it's proven hard to achieve. A bill was even drafted in 2016, but never passed. In today's discussion, we'll ask whether the time is ripe to try again. What are the options for reform and why has it been so hard to achieve progress? We're delighted to have on the panel today the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, the Scottish Ombudsman, and also panellists with experience of the political context for reform, the practicalities of achieving it, and its importance for those who use <coughs> public services. Rosemary Agnew, to my left, has been Scottish Public Service Ombudsman since 2017. She was previously the Scottish <coughs> Information Commissioner, and before that she worked for the Local Government Ombudsman in England. Since 2019, Rosemary has sat as Director on the UK Ombudsman Association Board. A very warm welcome to you, Rosemary. Patrick Vernon was awarded an OBE in 2012 for tackling health inequalities for ethnic minority communities in Britain. He's Honorary Professor of Cultural Heritage and Community Leadership at Wolverhampton University. He's been a leading campaigner for Windrush Day and kick-started the campaign for an amnesty for the Windrush generation. It's good to have you with us, Patrick. Sandra Vukuitin, OBE, was Chief Executive of the Hearing Aid Council from 2005 until she successfully closed it in 2010. She's had a distinguished career in health management. She served on the board of Remploy and has recently stepped down from being vice chair of the Lord's Taverners. <coughs> Welcome, Sandra. Sir Bernard Jenkin MP is the chair of the Liaison Committee and former chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in the House of Commons. He's been a Conservative MP since 1992. Thank you for being here, Bernard. And finally, I'd like to introduce the uh, Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman, Rob Behrens, who was appointed as Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman in 2017. He was previously the Complaints Commissioner at the Bar Standards Board and Independent Adjudicator for Higher Education in England and Wales. Rob was made a CBE for services to higher education in 2015. Thank you for joining us, Rob. And I believe you're going to kick us off um, by setting the scene um, on these issues from the Ombudsman's perspective about what the problem is and what might be done about them. Thank you. Thank you. Good, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honour to be here. It's lovely to be here with colleagues and friends who've done so much to push forward the Ombudsman concept uh, in the last uh, 25 years and thank you for what you've done. Thank you to the Institute for Government for hosting this and I'm very pleased to see those who are not here won't be able to see it but on the wall of this room is a picture of F.W. de Klerk and Nelson Mandela and I remember Nelson Mandela coming to Britain and addressing a joint meeting of the House of Lords and House of Commons and he started off by saying, don't think that I've come here to thank you. And I thought that was a wonderful beginning <laughs> because what it showed is that sometimes you have to speak truth unto power. And that's what an ombudsman does. And that's what we need to make sure we continue to do in all the questions about reform, which we're going to debate today. Uh, being independent, being impartial, uh, making sure we don't have... Uh, regulatory powers and ensuring that there is access for citizens and non-citizens to our services. But it's a struggle. 
It's 56 years since the UK Parliament created a national ombudsman scheme with an MP filter on complaints, which if you read the parliamentary debates was put in for a trial period of five years. It is 33 years since Robbie Powell died, an avoidable death in a Welsh hospital, and his case files were tampered with after his death. And it's nine years since the Crown Prosecution Service opened a case file on this matter after evidence of police corruption was unveiled, unveiled, and they still have to report on it. And I've been supporting the Powell family in calling for a public inquiry to no avail for the last uh, four and a half years. It's 11 years since Joshua Titcombe died of undiagnosed sepsis, prompting Bill Kirkup's report into Morecambe Bay. And just a few months since he reported on the same failures in East Kent. And what is shocking is that he said not much has changed in that time. Mm and uh, we can't go on having politicians saying something must be done and then nothing much is done as a result of it. And in the same year, Matthew Leahy died in mental health care, aged just 20, a few days after being admitted. I looked at this case. I found 19 instances of service failure, including the alteration of his notes after he died, a failure to consult the family and a refusal to investigate complaints that he had been raped while he was in hospital. We knew at the Ombudsman Service that 20, uh, 25 other people had died in the same institution, but because their families had not complained, I couldn't investigate uh, uh, the wider issues involved with the hospital because I wasn't allowed to under the law. And it's seven years to finish off since I was asked to become Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman and was asked by the Cabinet Office to stay for a year to give time for the passage of a Public Service <coughs> Ombudsman Bill. Well, I stayed and waited and I hoped and I campaigned and we're still here today. These incidents and dates are illustrative of a public service culture that with very many honourable exceptions is defensive, hierarchical, resistant to learning lessons and difficult to access and make complaints about. Now, I accept that a reform of our national and local government ombudsman schemes is no magic bullet. It won't of itself change the culture or the accountability of public administration or the health service. It won't solve the very big, wider problem of the unjoined up nature of our administrative justice system involving courts, tribunals, and ombudsman schemes who don't work closely enough with each other. It won't bring back Robbie Powell, or Joshua Titcomb, or Matt Leahy, or hundreds of other people who've died in public service situations. But three key reforms to the National Ombudsman Service will help to make a difference. Building on our unique role as a free service, handling complaints impartially and independently to make operationally things better in public administration. And these reforms, which we're arguing for, will draw on, first of all, what works already for our devolved and international partners who have newer mandates, who have the powers which we're asking for. They work, we need them, and we need to draw on them. Secondly, it will draw on our international obligations under the Venice Principles and the 2020 United Nations General Assembly on Ombudsman Practice, both of which the UK has signed up to. And thirdly, it will help to ensure a better organic connection between citizens and non-citizens who will be able to better access the free and impartial service that the National Ombudsman provides. That will create, and we have published the evidence today, a more efficient and effective service 
And the most important thing that we want, in addition to the change of behavior, which we can, in, in our staff, which we can create through our own non-legal reforms, is we need to streamline the number of public service ombudsman schemes that are available. We need to create one joined up public service ombudsman so that people know where and when to complain so that we resist the situation where half of the people who ring us each year, the 120,000 people who ring us each year are coming to the wrong place to complain and they need advice about where to complain to. We need a service that brings together in one institution complaints about the treatment of health and social care together, not separately and where complaints about central and local government are also treated together. Those are things that occur in all modern European societies. We don't have it in England, although it exists in devolved countries. Now, the precise details of this cannot just be written on a philosopher's stone. They need to be based on genuine consultation uh, before and after the general election. But we need to get rid of the silly suggestion that it would be based on all 16 or so public sector ombuds schemes coming together and operating in England. What we want is limited and proportionate and is not about bringing everybody together. Secondly, we want to give citizens direct access to justice by removing the MP filter for cases about central government departments. I accept we know that MPs have a constitutional duty to represent their citizens and they clearly should have a supporting role in the handling of complaints to the Ombudsman by, by constituents. But at the moment MPs are making the decision or not making the decision about whether to forward complaints to my office. That should be the responsibility and duty of the complainant, not of the MP. The filter actively discourages people from complaining to my office. Last year, 88% of people who came to us directly and were told that they needed the support of their MP fell out of the system. They did not come back to us. And that cannot be right in terms of access. We've had at PHSO an alternative policy on this since 2011 to allow citizens to choose whether or not to come via their MP and always to keep the MP informed about what's going on. That is a sensible compromise. It would be compliant with the Venice principles and connect the Ombudsman as an office in Parliament to the communities that it serves. We also need, and this is important, to be able to investigate systemically where people don't feel able to go through the complaints process. Own initiative powers, however that describes it, perhaps wrongly, are necessary in order to connect us with marginalised communities. With care and caution, we need the opportunity to investigate exceptional issues not complained about and often in communities least likely to complain. Colleagues in devolved nations, in Ireland, in the majority of countries in the International Ombudsman Institute already have this power. They use it sensibly and modestly and now routinely and we think that we need it too. Our joint study with the International Ombudsman Institute of 57 national schemes in 38 countries demonstrated in 2021 that these own initiative investigations contributed to resolving issues which arose out of the COVID pandemic with speed and precision. I want to mention Windrush. With own initiative powers, this scandal could have been investigated much more quickly by us than leaving it to the Home Office to begin the investigation. 
under the law, we turn out to be the fourth party that Windrush complainants would come to. And I know because I've talked to them that many felt that they couldn't come to us because they didn't either know about us or have the confidence that their MP would support their claim. Now, I mentioned Matthew Leahy, and that's a relevant case as well. My office could have investigated the hospital where 25 deaths occurred far more comprehensively than we were able to because we could only look at those people, those families who had complained. We're now in a situation where the government's late and preferred solution to this was to set up an independent inquiry. And only a couple of weeks ago, the inquiry chair announced she was having little success in getting voluntary participation and evidence from clinical staff who would have been key witnesses. That is not acceptable. Now, I want to end in this way. I've come here to listen and to debate, not to give a monologue. Ombudsman reform, and the term ombudsman may be gender biased. I don't want to uh, leave without have, have putting that on the table. But it is not without evidence or precedent. Everything that we're asking for is appropriately applied in other countries. And the United Kingdom is miles behind our international partners in the structures that ombudsmen need to do their job. Reform must be conducted in a non-party political way, focusing on the big issues of public trust, redress for citizens, effective consultation, and learning and accountability in the whole of the public sector. The most recent International Ombudsman Peer Review of PHSO, which you may have seen published online, uh, a valuable study for you to have a look at, that said that our office had done a great deal in terms of non-required professional development of staff, quality control, transparency in publishing cases, and the transformative PHSO complaint standards for all bodies in jurisdiction. And that we had a great deal to share with our international counterparts. But they concluded in 2022 just as Peter Tyndall, who I'm glad is with us today, concluded with his peer review in 2018, that our impact could be significantly enhanced with the broad range of legislative reforms that have been so long delayed. I urge you to support that development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. So we'll now move into a period of discussion amongst the panel before we open to uh, questions from the audience in the, in the second half of today's session. I'd like to begin by turning to, to Rosemary. I just to ask really how your experience compares uh, with Rob's. So the Scottish Ombudsman is working with more recent legislation. Um, and how is it established differently and does it work better for you? I hesitate to say better. I think differently. Um, for me, the question is, does it work better for citizens? and for users of public services. And I think, yes, it does. Um, and I'm going to perhaps focus on two specific issues. Um, I don't have own initiative powers, or as um, I prefer to call them public interest investigatory powers, but I do have complaint standards um, where I set standards for complaint handling, um, powers which, which is one of the areas that Rob does not have. Now, the first thing I, I think where it works better in Scotland is the most obvious one of the lack of MP filter. Anybody can come to the Ombudsman if they have um, had an experience where the service they received had an impact on them and they wish to complain. Now, we don't necessarily investigate in the first instance, um, and I'll come back to the uh, complaint standard powers, but I think there are some really important reasons why people should be able to complain for themselves. And the first one is focusing on the experience that they have been through. It can be traumatic. Just having to complain can create a traumatic experience. And you might not want to share that with an, M an MP. Um, 
If you have to share it with an MP, good complaint investigation asks people to talk about what they've been through, what they're complaining about. You're getting people to relive their trauma several times by having to go to different people. Um, I also think, I agree entirely with Rob, it should be an individual's choice about whether they want to complain. So I, I think that for me is probably the first big area. Um, I, I could speak for the whole afternoon on the differences, but um, I will focus on just two. The other is Complaints Standards Authority, which, which is what the duties are called. And they require me to lay principles, complaint, model complaints handling before the Scottish Parliament. And that gives them effect of being statutory. So public bodies in Scotland follow a very, very similar complaint process. Now, why this is particularly helpful is resolution is best achieved at the point that it's raised. By the time it reaches an ombudsman, we do some fantastic work. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an ombudsman. Um, we do some amazing work. But how much better would it be for the individual if somebody right at the outset said, do you know what, we got that wrong, and I'm really sorry, and this is what we'll do to put it right, and this is what we'll do to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else. The best learning happens at local level. Um, the advantage of the Complaint Standards Authority powers, though, is it gives you a different relationship with public bodies. So you can share good experience. You can share what went well, because there's as much, probably more learning from sharing what works as opposed to individual events that didn't work. And, and I think for me, that's been one of the most transformative powers in many ways, because if you can get public bodies to start, I won't say welcoming and embracing complaints, but certainly learning from them, accepting, taking ownership of the issues that are being complained about, then I think you create a much more um, level access for, for all citizens in that respect. So I will just leave with those two for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that's powerful testimony, I think, from both of you about the consequences <laughs> of individuals who aren't able to access um, uh, redress through the, through the system being being left behind and that that feels very very consequential um, maybe I can I can turn now to, um, to, to to Bernard and ask well you've been involved in this debate for many years now um, what future do you see for um, the, the PHSO working from here and what are the barriers to achieving that I see two possible scenarios. Um, uh, one, uh, let me just say that I, when I was chairman of PASC, we produced this report called Time for a People's Ombudsman Service. And we quoted the then Scottish Public Service Ombudsman on the front cover. The model in England is stuck in time. It probably was good for its time, but I think its time has passed. Um, so. I'm afraid one, vi one vision for PHSO is it becomes more and more of a relic of a bygone age, frankly, uh, because it's very paper-based, it's got this MP filter, which is very hierarchical. Um, incidentally, when people argue against getting rid of the MP filter, they seem to forget that 80% of the cases now are health cases, and they were never subject to a filter, and they're not subject to a filter. So, I mean, the whole thing about the MP filter is totally anachronistic. Um, I think it's, it's sort of patronising and um, um, really from the age of deference that you know, such a, a mechanism had to exist. Um, but the systems that the Ombudsman is required to use and the culture it's in, and that, that flows from it uh, is really outdated. And um, so that's one future. The alternative future, but to, to do this report... Um, I took the committee to Holland to look at the Dutch Ombudsman Service, mm. where the um, equivalent of PHSO is a known national figure. And the recognition of the Ombudsman Service is, is very high. OK, it's a small country. It's a much less complicated country. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, he, is, he or she is seen as a sort of champion of the consumer, of the customer, of the service user, of... Um, the public and the voice of 
those who have become victims of failure of, of, in public services, and a very wide-ranging powers, all the powers that um, uh, um, Rob was talking about, um, that, is the, that is the alternative vision for PHSO, and that's the vision I very much favour. Um, uh, what's the barrier to that? What's holding that up at the moment? Um, at the time we produced this, uh, we had, this, this followed a previous um, uh, inquiry we'd done into uh, complaints handling in general across Whitehall. Um, and we had a, 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 a publication, which I recommend to you, called More Complaints, Please, uh, where we discovered that actually the, the really high-functioning organisations in our society are hungry for complaints. They want this information because they know that's how they can improve their service. Um, we had a quote on the front of that front cover from um, uh, the former chief executive of First Direct about how important complaints are for nourishing the culture in order to make it more responsible to its customers. Um, uh, but the barrier we have at the moment, that was at a time when uh, Francis Maud of um, Citizens Charter fame was the Cabinet Office Minister and he was very keen on, on engagement with citizens. He digitised the... Um, 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 digitised many of the platforms that interface with the... I mean, anybody been on DVLA recently? It's such a good system. Um, I mean, he was responsible for all that. Um, very customer-focused minister. And there was an appetite for doing this sort of stuff that really hasn't existed since 2015 um, because we got bogged down in referendums, Brexit, Covid, all kinds of internecine feuding. Um, but I hope that we can get back to that appetite. I was just um, remarking earlier that um, actually... Um, one of the people who served on my committee from 2010 until he became a minister was a former special advisor in the cabinet office who had worked with Francis Maud um, very closely on many things, somebody called Oliver Dowden, uh, who is now the, um, uh, runs the cabinet office as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And, you know, we, maybe there is an appetite as parties approaching the general election think about, well, how are we going to make public services more responsive to the public? Um, uh, how are we going to make the public feel heard? Um, you know, what is the retail offer that we put in our manifestos or that we uh, propose in legislation? And certainly ombudsman reform it, it will be one of, those, one of those appetites I hope we can stimulate. Thank you very much. Um, I want to turn to you now, Sandra. So you, you, you led the successful reform of the, of the Hearing Aid Council um, in circumstances that have a number of parallels with, with those that PHSO is, is, is now facing, particularly the legislative complexity around this. Um, what can the PHSO learn from, from your experience now? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, that you can survive. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's difficult. It's complicated. Um, and you will be um, taken down very many um, dead ends in terms of uh, some of the things that you want to achieve. Um, I quickly learnt that um, when the government decided that the Hearing Aid Council was to be abolished, they really didn't know what abolition meant. And, and indeed, the Hearing Aid Council as a body was abolished. But the services to consumers not only remain, but are significantly enhanced. So you and I as consumers can make sure that should we wish to purchase hearing aids in the private sector, um, that it's at the right standard. But once we had um, established that not Many people understood what abolition was, and I'm, I'm talking about civil service, servants, I'm talking about ministers. I think we learned that we had to do an awful lot of the work. Um, we couldn't rely on others to do the work for us if we were to abolish and reform um, the organisation and the service to consumers and citizens of this country. So we took that on board. It was a great investment of time, 
not so much money, um, but it really was complicated. But we worked on building relationships and more importantly, trust with all of our stakeholders. And I'll come on to the stakeholders later. So I think in terms of what can be learnt is that you need tenacity, you need courage, um, you need to invest a great deal of time whilst you're running an organisation. You know, Rob's got a very complex organisation. Funnily enough, my little organisation was equally as complex in not so many people that were complaining, but it was complex. So you're running an organisation and you're trying to reform where there are so many barriers. So you have to be prepared to start knocking down some of those barriers um, in whatever way is really needed. Um, so um, you do need the courage that goes with it. Thanks, Sandra. So um, there's a lot of work in this and it's a challenge. Um, Patrick, maybe you could talk a little bit. To, um, why is this worth it? What would reform actually achieve for the people who rely on the Ombudsman? Uh, good afternoon. Of course, it makes a big difference. Uh, Rob referred to the picture of uh, Nelson Mandela. If I can refer to Nelson Mandela again. Um, when he came over to Britain after his incarceration, Rob and Robin Ireland, he met a family, the Lawrence family, and they were struggling for justice for the murder of their son, Stephen, which was uh, done by racists, covered, by, covered up by the police, and then he then, then Nelson Mandela heard this case, met the family, and guess what he did? He spoke to Jack Straw and he said, you better sort this out. And that led to the McPherson report. It led to changes in the law, the Race Relations Amendment Act of 2010, uh, which is now codified in the quality legislation. But if, if then we roll the clock forward 27 years later to the Windrush scandal, <coughs> where the only reason why the government took seriously the needs and the issues around the scandal was initially the, the great work that Emilia Gentle was doing, doing profiles uh, in the Garden newspaper, but it wasn't even taken seriously then, even though there, were, there was a debate uh, at uh, Parliamentary Question Time raised by, on one of the cases. It actually took uh, Caribbean diplomats, and it's, it's very rare for diplomats to actually criticise a host country, but 14 of the Caribbean diplomats, which reflect CARICOM, they were lobbying the, the, home, the Foreign Commonwealth Office and the Home Office, raising these concerns. Um, but it was when I did my petition which, on the UK government website that over 200,000 people signed, that gave the permission for everyone to really say enough is enough. So I think, um, yes, you're quite right, Rob. Yes, you should have been there earlier, but maybe you weren't allowed to be there earlier. Because I think when you look at the name Parliamentary Ombudsman, Yes, we need to get the red man, definitely, and make it gender neutral, we have to. Otherwise, we are excluding a whole range of part of British society. We've moved on in Britain in the last 20 odd years uh, in terms of gender, race equality, sexual orientation, age. And so the, the, the new body, if there was to be a new body, has to reflect Britain in the 21st century, not Britain of the 20th century. Actually, it should reflect Britain in the 22nd century, basically. Um, so I think one of the key issues uh, around what's it look like for ordinary citizens, whether from black, brown communities, whether from women, LG, it's, people feel that if I go forward to make a complaint, will I be taken seriously? Will you do something with this? But to do that, people have to feel there's trust and confidence in the system. And we still have a lot of work to do around trust and confidence. I mean, I think the pandemic has further reinforced the need for all public bodies to work that extra harder to gain the trust and confidence of communities. A survey was done last year by a black equity organisation, new organisation, and they interviewed um, over 2,500 uh, people of African-Caribbean heritage in the UK and asked some serious questions about trust and confidence. And the vast majority of people don't trust the NHS, even less so with the police and even politicians. So there's still a lot of work to do around trust and confidence. So if we're gonna have a, 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 an a independent accountable body, which is part of the system, it has to demonstrate over and above that it can build that trust and confidence. Great, many thanks, Patrick. Um, 
Rob, I'm going to um, maybe ask you one of the first questions that's come in online, which is um, whether joined up ombudsmen are a good thing. You mentioned earlier that you're not looking to combine all 16 ombudsmen, just uh, a couple of them. But maybe the, in, in, in combination with that, what can you achieve or how much of your objectives could you achieve without legislative change? We've already achieved a huge amount in turning around the organisation in the last six years in terms of the professionalization of the case handlers that we have, in terms of uh, far advanced accreditation of case workers, the complaint standards framework, which many of you will already know about, which we have worked up in partnership with the health service and with central government, which is entirely non-legislative and has been bought because it's a partnership, not because there's any coercive issue into it. And what that's saying is that frontline bodies could be much better at handling their own complaints and sending them on to the ombudsman to, to resolve. But they need development, it needs investment, they need to share good practice. All of that is without any form of legislation to require anybody to do anything. There's so much that we can do in terms of transparency. Uh, this month I'm going, following my Dutch uh, counterpart, Rainier von Zuten, Bernard, I'm going on uh, a tour and I'm going to set up in Stockton on Tees, as he does in Utrecht next week, and I'm going to meet citizens and go to community groups and work with local organisations to find out what the issues are. You don't need legislation to do that, you can do it. We'll do that on a quarterly basis to ensure that we come much better known as a result of what we're doing. So I have never argued that we need legislation to become effective. I argue we need legislation to allow people to understand where it is they need to go. So why am I not a public figure when the Dutch uh, ombudsman is a public figure. Is it because he's more charismatic than I am? Possibly. But, but, but the real answer is there's only one Dutch ombudsman. Yeah, that's easier. And there's a public service ombudsman in Holland. People know where to go. Whereas there are 16 public service ombuds in the UK, in England even. And you have to be very knowledgeable to know where to go, given that there are also regulators who sit alongside us. Uh, so there may be 36 bodies in all that you might make a, a judgment about where to go. So it is very complicated for people to understand where to go. And we need one body as an ombuds to be able to be a focal point for people as a beacon of last resort, and it's greatly needed. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rosemary, um, if, if these reforms were achieved, would they make a difference for people across the UK? So outside of, of, of England, would it, would it make a difference for people for whom you're responsible as well? Well, yes, because there are still things that are not devolved to um, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, I was thinking International Women's Day on Wednesday, the theme of equity versus equality. And, and I think that's the phrase that stuck in my mind when thinking about this. There will be greater equity across a range of services in terms of who you can complain to, what you can complain about, how you can do that. But I think, as well, this has to tie in with, um, someone uses the phrase of um, people who don't know, uh, people who rely on the ombudsman. I think these reforms, if they were carried to the point that they need to be, would also help those who don't know that they rely on the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's probably where the biggest impact would be. Um, personally, if, if Rob had own initiative powers, because I, I don't have them, I think I'd have more chance of getting them if I was the only one in the UK without them. Um, but I think there are some other things that would have to be UK-wide, and they're the more intangible things, like the culture of public service. Um, because the culture is very different between different sectors, but it's also very different between the different nations of the UK. Um, and, and I think if there was a, at least a standard that we all were able to um, work with the same set of powers, we could do much more in terms of benchmarking. We could learn, 
citizens could learn. Service users also then wouldn't get a different service depending on where they needed to complain to. Where, if they were in Scotland, if it was a, a devolved matter, um, they, they can expect the same level of complaint handling service um, as, as you'd get in Scotland, where we have um, uh, the more structured approach with complaint standard authority powers. Um, I, I think the other thing, and again, this is maybe slightly more intangible, but if you don't have, I nearly said ombudsman. I, I completely agree with all the things about gender neutral, but um, I think my own personal preference will never catch on, and I want to be an ombudshuman because I still want to be a person. Um, <laughs> But I, th I think one of the, the things that happens, if there are gaps in that oversight ombudsman landscape, the temptation is to fill them with another ombudsman scheme or another commissioner or another regulator. Um, and, and actually what you end up with is even more fragmentation mm -hmm. across the whole of the UK. So a good example is the patient safety commissioner that's been created in Scotland is slightly different to what there is in England. And I use that as a parallel because if Rob's powers were commensurate with my powers with um, Michelle in Wales, Margaret in Northern Ireland, you are more likely to get equity when it comes to how public services are challenged. Thank you. I mean, these, <coughs> these points around developing a culture of public <coughs> service, knowing who to go to for, a, for to, to be able to um, um, realise a complaint. These are things that ought to have strong popular appeal. So, I mean, Bernard, what can the PHSO and other interested parties do to build a stronger political consensus around the importance of this issue? Um, I think that, that, that this is in danger of being a very dry technical discussion. <coughs> I mean, because you know, and particularly when it's complicated, mm. um, and we talk about different jurisdictions and different ombudsmen doing this, that and the other, you know, people's eyes tend to glaze over unless they are the actual person with the complaint, with the, with the grievance, with the matter requiring redress. Um, uh, and I don't, at the moment, feel there are a lot of MPs really motivated to get involved in this. I think it needs a bit of visionary leadership about customer service, mm. help focusing on service users. It needs to go, that's what it needs. Mm. Um, uh, it needs a bit of political leadership. Um, but I do think that um, uh, all the various ombuds bodies that exist have an opportunity uh, to work together and um, promote this. Some of them will be um, perhaps hastening their own um, merging into another organisation, which is always a little bit um, um, uh, of a touchy subject, but um, because there needs to be some consolidation, as Rob says. Um, but uh, everybody I ever came across who works in an ombuds, ombuds service uh, is utterly committed to what they're doing and um, profoundly disturbed, usually, by some of the cases uh, that they come across. I mean, the, the investigators actually require a lot of support in some of the really, really traumatic issues that they're dealing with. Um, and um, uh, these are very, very moving subjects, as you've heard from other members of the panel already. Um, this is a really big area that really matters to people's lives. Um, and, you know, we all hope we'll never need our insurance policy if our house burns down. We will all hope that we'll never be in a car crash and having to uh, deal with life-changing industries, injuries and claiming off our insurers. But, you know, the insurance companies are nevertheless very important. Um, and the ombuds, ombuds, ombuds services are the same. But I think we need to tap into that, to tap into something fairly inspirational that will um, actually motivate p how people might vote for the different political parties at the general election. I mentioned manifestos before. I think that um, uh, we need to engage the political leaderships of all the political parties and say, you're missing a trick here if you're not looking after your customer base um, out there in the public who very, many, very often feel they don't have a voice. Mm. 
Thanks, Bernard. I mean, Sandra, you also spoke earlier about the importance of a clear vision of, 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 of what's to be achieved. So, I mean, in, in your experience, who are the key people that you need to persuade? And how do you persuade them and how do you keep them on side through a process of change? I, th I think one of the first things that we learned was, and you can get lulled into a false sense of security, is that you actually believe that you know who those people are. Mm. You know who your key stakeholders are and you know who is going to be the influencer that's going to help <coughs> you to achieve what it is that you wish to achieve. We quickly learned that we really didn't know. You can map out the fact that you've got um, MPs, you've got civil servants, you've got the industry leaders, um, the professionals, the consumer bodies. But we learnt that everyone was a stakeholder and everyone was an influencer. Because as time evolved and our ideas became clearer as to what we wish to achieve on behalf of the consumers of the UK, is that we realised that there were more and more people that we should consult, that we should take uh, cognizance of, that we should listen to, as to what it was that was required for the future um, and to make whatever we were doing um, future-proof. I'm happy to say that as I sit here today, our, leg our new legislation um, has been future-proof and it works, believe it or not, for those of you that are here that may need hearing aids in the future, it will work for you. But we learnt that do not underestimate who can have an influence um, and keep thinking about who your influencers are, who your stakeholders are, and consult, communicate. And one of the tricks was to communicate in different languages. Mm. Don't assume also that what you say to one group is going to be understood by another group, even though you're using the same language. Um, so we, we challenged our communication skills all the time. Great. Thank you. Um, Patrick, uh, before we open up to the, to the floor for questions, um, I, I was going to ask you, um, you know, what would be the consequences if nothing happened in this space, if we didn't succeed in achieving this sort of change? But I thought I'd combine that as well. We've had a question online from Myro Griffiths about improving the representation of marginalised communities within ombudsman's processes, strategies and evaluations. How can communities have an influential role in shaping these services going forward? So if nothing happens for the next seven years, it'll be more of the same. And more of the same is there'll be less trust with agencies and organisations that are delivering services. Uh, the, the, um, those people will still be confused where to go to make a complaint. Currently in the NHS, there are 60 different ways that you could complain about your health care treatment, so that will still continue. Um, there's, there's this fragmentation will continue, continue. And then people, you know, I mean, there's, there's an, I mean, we talk about the um, need to have some energy and enthusiasm. There is lots of energy and enthusiasm out there in the community, but it's, it's for politicians to be open to that and to have that dialogue. So it's great that you're going to stop on tease to do that dialogue. And if more politicians did that, that might build that confidence and they might realise we need to change of around public around service reform. But representation is also critical. You know, um, just a recent case, only recently, where um, and Michelle Cox, who worked for the NHS, um, was discriminated on race uh, and gender. But it wasn't so much the fact that she was discriminated around uh, various appointments that she went for. It was, just the, it was the appeal process internally within the NHS that let her down. So in that situation, um, that's when you realise actually reform needs to happen. So that's quite important because there are lots of these cases. Why should it go to industrial tribunal when it's about a process around the way someone's been treated as well. As we approach the 75th anniversary of the NHS, as we approach the 75th anniversary of Empire Women just docking at Tilbury, 
this is an opportunity to reflect on 75, 75 years of Britain and public services. What more can we do better? Uh, and it's quite clear that there has to be changes and reforms. But let's learn lessons from the last major reforms around equality legislation. So when the CRE, Commission of Racial Equality, the Equality Commission, the Disability Rights Commission all merged together, um, there were winners and losers. Race came off the agenda. It, only, it took, sadly, the murder of an African-American male in Minnesota and the research of Black Lives Matter for us to have this national conversation around race, which is probably coming to an end now. But why do we have to wait for these instances around the world for us to start rethinking about our own reforms around inclusion, around equality, etc.? We, you know, we, we, can, we know what the answers are. Let's just make it happen. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's important issues there, and particularly about around the, 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 the complaints process. So, uh, I mean, maybe it's, 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 it's worth thinking about that in terms of the way the, the Ombudsman interacts with the with, with sort of complaints process or authorities. We've also had a question come in online about the relation between the Ombudsman and regulators as well. So I wonder whether, uh, Rob Rose, before we open up to the floor, you wanted to reflect on that, on that relationship between complaints, processes, um, Ombudsman appeals and regulation and how that could be handled. Yeah, um, Ombudsmen are not regulators. Sorry, ombuds people are not regulators. I prefer the term public protector or defender of rights. I think that would be much better, but we have what we have. We're, we are not regulators. We have no coercive power to force people to do things. And we need to understand the clear blue water between us and regulators. At the same time, as uh, you may have seen the reports in the media about our reaction to Birmingham University Hospitals Trust, where there are big issues which regulators have known about, which we have been investigating. We decided that we needed to uh, kickstart our emerging concerns protocol, which we have with regulators, to put into the public domain the fact that we were seriously concerned about what's going on in that uh, hospital trust. Now, firstly, it's important that we work with regulators. We're part of the regulatory framework. We're not regulators ourselves. <coughs> Secondly, you could reasonably ask the question, why did it take the ombudsman to kickstart the protocol rather than the regulators themselves? But that's for another day. The point is we're working together on this to raise the issues so that the hospital can get it sorted out. There, there is, should be one national onboard service and many regulators, but far fewer regulators. And, you know, health is a dramatically uh, over-cluttered and crowded field when it comes to regulators, and that needs to be addressed quite quickly. Thanks, Rob. I'll now take some questions from the, the floor. So please wait for the microphone. Start by saying who you are and your organisation, please, and please keep your questions brief. I'll, I'll take them uh, in, in groups. So anybody have a question they would like to ask? Uh, Tony. Uh, first, I must apologise for arriving late. Uh, I'm Tony Travers from the London School of Economics. This point has come up sort of implicitly from all the contributors. And that is that, in a sense, ombuds humans, ombuds people, ombuds, are on the other side of a process at the end of some pretty dismal behaviour, generally. And in public service, and this is all investigating public service, there are very highly paid professionals in public service, there's a hint in the name there, who obviously, to varying degrees, employ lots of other people to write letters to the public to fob them off. That's the implication of this entire discussion. So I just wonder whether the terms and conditions of senior managers in the, serv the relevant services ought to be altered somewhat in order to make them more likely to respond to public complaints rather than hiding behind a wall of cut out and paste responses which are designed precisely to fob people off. Thank you. Um, Support for that in the room. Any, any other questions uh, before we put that to panel? Uh, yes, the lady in the middle. 
Uh, thank you. I'm Grace Duffy from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, some of you may know we are uh, about to legislate to create a new ombuds, which I will try, but I do keep saying ombudsman, but I will try ombuds because I do agree, uh, for private rented sector landlords. I know the discussion has been really about public services, but sort of ultimately it's about justice and redress. And so um, perhaps you'd be able to give us some advice for the team who are uh, looking to establish this uh, ombud service in the near future. In particular about how we can best work with stakeholders and service users to, to as effectively as possible co-design that service. I'm particularly thinking about how uh, we make it as um, user-friendly for vulnerable or excluded uh, uh, people to use. Because as um, I can't remember who's perhaps it's Patrick said, these are the people that are least likely to to make use of the service. And then secondly, this thought, and I think it might have been uh, Rosemary who mentioned this, about the best way would be to resolve at the first point of complaint if you can. And obviously we have a particularly um, kind of unique group of stakeholders in terms of our landlords, many of whom will have a single property or very small portfolios, and some are big organisations with many uh, uh, properties, but many are not. And so sort of any thoughts or reflections on how we can bring those into uh, 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 to support those to, to be resolving complaints in the first instance. Um, but just any thoughts and advice of how we do it over the next couple of years? Well, we're very grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? We'll, we'll start with those two. So from Tony, um, how can management of services be encouraged to respond substantively to complaints rather than through a cut and paste? And can that be written into their terms and conditions? And from Grace, thinking of setting up a, a different ombuds, what is the advice on doing that, particularly how to work with users to, to co-design it? Um, who would like to start? Rob. Could I address Professor Travers's point? This is a, it goes to the heart of what we're doing. So first of all, uh, twice now in the Times in the last six months, I've been interviewed, I've used the term fobbing off, and uh, civil servants and ministers have raised it with me that it's an unacceptable term to use uh, and that it doesn't happen. <laughs> and, uh, frankly, it does happen, it happens all the time, and it's a serious issue. That's number one. N number two, the dismal behaviour which you describe impacts on the views of service users of us as ombuds people and what sir bernard was saying about the difficulty the challenges of people answering the telephone to those who've been badly and dismally treated means that they have to have exceptional training to deal with that in a way which recognizes the situation that they're in so that's absolutely right the terms and conditions are not going to change very much, in my humble view. What's going to change is a culture of leadership in which the leaders of public sector organisations see it as their responsibility to tell people who work for them and to educate them and to train them to be more transparent, to be more open, to, be, to take people... Uh, um, face to face in, in addressing issues and not simply to defend the organisation that they're uh, representing. Now I just say this, it applies in the civil service as well. I, I once went to a minister in a department and I asked him if he would like to come to uh, a PHSO ombudsman uh, public meeting, open public meeting, to hear what people really thought. Now, Sir Bernard actually, it wasn't about him, but he actually came without, you know, he did it. He walked the talk. He came and he listened to it. The minister said to me, goodness me, I couldn't possibly do that. That's why we have an ombudsman to hear complaints. <laughs> and, you know, that defensiveness goes across the board. And it can apply to ombudsmen people in trouble as well. So we, should, we shouldn't be precious about that. It's a cultural change that's needed. It's leadership. It's not about... Uh, conditions of service. That's one. Rosemary, you want to comment on? Um, I'd, I'd second that, and I don't think terms and conditions of individuals actually would get to the heart of what's needed. The first thing I'd say is, as ombudsmen, we tend to only see the really negative, dismal things. There are some fantastic things every day in public service. You ask individual stories where people have not complained. Um, they will tell you about something that really good 
that happened. But you need to capture those as well as the dismal things. And it's the organisation that should be accountable for this, not just the individual's terms and conditions. If the organisation wants to put something in terms and conditions, that's up to them, in my view. But until you hold an organisation accountable, not just for what you do with complaints, but also the culture of how you handle them, what do you do to demonstrate that you have learned from them? What difference and impact has your complaint handling made? And these are all the complaint standard authority um, type powers. Um, the other thing, and this partly answers um, one of the points about creating a new ombudsman, that link between governance and complaints and complaint standards is really critical because governance systems in organisations should be holding the executive to account. Um, so if you have, because of model complaints handling in Scotland, we actually have a governance bit in there about you should be reporting on this, you should be demonstrating learning on this. And it's a way where the organisation has to give assurance, not just, yes, we've learned, yes, we've handled complaints, um, I, I, the other side of this that I think is critical is, is actually data. And it's data about um, what you've looked at, how it was handled. We tend to traditionally just mark everything in terms of how long did it take. Um, and it's actually the quality of the investigation done in a good time. Better still, something handled at first instance where there is resolution and the learning has also been captured. So, yeah, I second Rob's view that I don't think terms and conditions is the way, but I think well-applied complaint standard authority powers are very definitely the way. Thanks, Rosemary. Sandra, you were going to come in, I think, on Grace's question. No, it was actually oh, okay. on Tony's uh, question, because as an ex-NHS Trust Chief Executive, I've been at the sharp end of those complaints coming in, and they are dismal, and they are horrible, some of them. Um, but my point is that to change things in any NHS organisation, any public service organisation, it is about the leadership. Um, and it isn't just about the executive leadership. Yes, I put myself in that position, but the chair and the non-execs have to have accountability and responsibility um, for what's going on in their organisation alongside the executive. And they must scrutinise. And you must have the governance system that brings everything back to the board to be able to say, how many complaints have we got in? What are the kinds of complaints? What are the kinds of themes that we are seeing? And how are we changing things in the organisation to improve the patient journey and to make sure that you don't do the nasty things and the dismal things? that do happen on a daily basis. You're not going to be able to prevent everything because we're dealing with human beings here. Um, but certainly with my experience, and even today as a non-exec on boards, I certainly believe that everything should come back to the board as a collective. And therefore, it's not an individual's terms and conditions. It is the culture and it is the, the way that the organisation behaves and values what their end user experience is. Great, thank you. And Bernard, you wanted to come in as well? Well, I mean, to link the two questions together, because actually what the, the Ombuds services are all about improving accountability. Um, in respect of Ombuds services in particular, it's about improving accountability by providing users with redress for where things have gone wrong um, and the great temptation in all these things i mean we've just got riots going on in greece because of a, a train crash is people resort to blame but it's very often and, and your question is loaded with blame for these people who are behaving in these adverse ways but what are the incentives on these people that they want to be, I, I don't know anybody that's joined the civil servants service who's joined in order that they would like to fob people off. I just don't think that happens. I think people go into public service mm -hmm. to try and serve them, but the, but the incentives go wrong, don't they? Because people confuse 
when they, people sprinkle around this word accountability, what do we want to hold providers of public services accountable for? Do we just want to blame them when they go wrong? Or do we want to hold them accountable for what they're going to do when they learn something has gone wrong to put them right? And unfortunately, party politics really militates towards the former. Um, uh, oppositions do blame. Uh, they're generally not interested in learning for improvement. They're doing blame in order to get themselves elected. Um, so the whole atmosphere in Whitehall starts from this very, very blameworthy um, culture, which is reinforced by a press that thrives on blame. Big blame stories sell newspapers uh, if they're on the front page. What was the whole thing about Grenfell about to start with? It was blame, 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 blame. And it was the same with the Labrook Grove train crash. But in the end, what came out of the Labrook Grove train crash was a very good public inquiry, which implemented lots of learning. And I hope the same is happening on Windrush. I hope the same is going to happen on Grenfell. In all this, uh, go governance and leadership are essential. And what people in charge of governance and leadership of public services should be concerned about is reputation. And reputation, if you are, you, you have a good reputation if when a mistake is pointed out, uh, a failing is pointed out, you say, please come and see me, we need to learn from this, as opposed to saying, uh, fobbing somebody off. And I think there's a sort of failure in imagination in a great many people that if only they'd say, oh, I'm so sorry about that, come and explain it to me and we'll see what we can put it right. I mean, it's very easy to say in an in, in abstract, it's very difficult to do in practice when you're under a great deal of public scrutiny and public pressure. But we need to think about what accountability is for, how we improve confidence in public services, which depends upon the reputation of the governance and the leadership. Um, and that would be my message to Grace, really. If you're setting up an ombuds service, think about what it is really for. It's there to improve the service that people get. And it's not, if you just go around shooting everybody who's got a bit of muck stuck to them because something went wrong, you will not get very far. If, you, if you're setting up an ombud service that is going to be learning and improving, then people will flock to it because, you know, no MP has sat in his surgery or her surgery and not experienced people coming to say, see you about, say, a health service, a clinical incident gone wrong. Oh, but we really don't want to complain. We just want to make sure this doesn't happen to somebody else. It doesn't happen again. And it's when they're, they're, they're fobbed off with people trying to protect the reputations of clinicians or the reputation of the, the trust or... Um, and they're fobbed off and the, the information isn't given to them, and then they, they resort to litigation and they, they become very interested in blame because um, the non-adversarial approach has failed them. So I do think the whole purpose of an ombud service is to say, let's find out what's really gone wrong. And if, some, if you've been mistreated or you've had the wrong service, we will get you compensation, but let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And then I think people will have public, much more confidence in public service and indeed our system of government. Many thanks, Bernard. Um, I, I know you may have to leave a few minutes before we finish. I'm very sorry about that. Um, I've got a two o'clock meeting. For your, for your thank you very much. Um, Patrick, do you want to... Yeah, just briefly, yes, I've got to take um, one more round of I think you're popping a ton of, can of worms there, Tony. Maybe hence that was, that's why you're at the front. But anyway, um, <laughs> if people, if public servants... Are, oh, I've got my phone there. If they follow the Nolan principles and there's more accountability around their performance-related pay, there may be, that could answer your question, maybe, just maybe. Um, are you, I know you're leaving. I don't think we've learned lessons of Grenfell, and we haven't learned lessons of the Windrush scandal. That further reinforces that mistrust between citizens and government, because if the government says, we've commissioned an independent inquiry or a report, we're going to learn the lessons, and we're going to implement the lessons, and then you turn around and say, actually, we're not quite sure if we've learned the lessons, because we don't really hear the hard truth yeah. out there, yeah. then that further reinforces lack of trust with government. So, and that's a lesson for the future, um, and particularly the private rental sector, which is a nightmare. Good luck to you, that's all I can say, seriously. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, it really is, actually. How are you going to, you know, because most of the complaints are, will be around conditions of disrepair. How are you going to, how, that, how can you support individuals in that situation where you've got landlords who may not want to implement reports, they've probably been told. I mean, remember, complaints, is the last resort. 
It's not the first resort, yeah. it's the last. People have gone through the mill and it's the last, last resort of action. And if we still fob them off, then people give up. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our culture. Thanks, Patrick. And that relates to... Can, can I bring you in once we've taken the last round of no, questions please. here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, we've just got a couple of minutes uh, left. I'd like to bring in a question that we've had online, which is <coughs> related to what you just said, Patrick, actually talking about the private sector. And is there an opportunity for shared learning between public sector ombudsman and services for the private sector? Um, is there anybody else in the room who wanted to... The lady in the red there. Hello, um, I'm Janet Cook, I'm retired. I really, I suppose I'm not on the panel, but I just, I couldn't sit here any longer and not respond to a couple of the points I've just heard. Um, I started my career in housing, social housing. I left about 20 odd years ago because I didn't like the way the sector was going. Um, and in terms of your point and Tony's point, um, I had nothing to do with housing until very recently. And I've been quite shocked at some of the things I've seen um, in the public sector. Um, and actually, if you track back, it's not a question of blaming, it's tracking back people who are senior staff um, and were very senior at the time when I was there. They've moved on. You can actually track a wave of, a wave of successful people who have not been accountable. They've been well protected, they've been very good, but I think there's something slightly wrong there. More recently, my last job before I retired was actually, we were the watchdog. We weren't an ombudsman, we, weren't, we were a statutory consultee and um, a statutory appeals body for transport users in around London, and particularly that referred to Transport for London. Now, the Transport for London, there's a lot that doesn't get right, but one of the things it did get right, and I think it probably still does get right, is the culture of senior staff. And we had regular access to very senior staff at TFL, so we could influence them. We didn't have to wait for the complaints, though we were a complaints body, and they responded, because the quality of travel in London for public transport users is a whole series of really mundane little things that actually aren't big deals, but if you add them up, make a huge difference. So I just really wanted to throw my threepence worth in to all of that. It does get back to accountability and leadership, and not blaming, but just making sure people don't keep getting away with things. Okay. Thank you. And there's one last question, the gentleman there by the door. Uh, my name's Trevor, and I just wanted to say that I do, I do think terms and conditions are very important. Mm. And the reason why terms and conditions are important, um, if I'm fobbing you off uh, as a senior um, worker in the Ombudsman Service or anything like that, I would say that's misconduct. So if if the senior staff know that their behaviour amounts to misconduct, they would possibly change the culture. And when I'm saying misconduct, if you're giving people false information, isn't that misconduct? If, so that's the only point I want to leave right. with you, that I think terms, you must write something in the terms and conditions of the senior officer, because just as that lady say, they move on and leave the service in disarray and um, everybody's saying they don't know what's going on. Great, thanks very much. So we've got a couple of questions there talking about the importance of the culture in organisations and then I think the question is what is the role of the Ombudsman in trying to change that and hold people to accountable in, in, in positions of power. We'd also had the question from online about the relationship between public and private sector ombuds and, and how they can interact. So taking those questions, but also thinking about your last words as we wrap up, I'll come to each of the panellists in turn. I'll start with you, Rosemary, because I think you wanted to come back on an earlier question as well. Yeah, I, I think the public-private sector shared learning is actually critical. And what this comes down to legislatively is making sure that there are the powers to be able to share information and data. Um, the, the culture side of it, we focus very much on the ombudsman end of things um, and the hold to account and all of those. If I were looking at some new ombuds legislation now, I would also be looking very carefully at the other end of it, at the accessibility of the lived user experience, particularly in, in housing, because somebody becomes very, very quickly vulnerable if they get a raw deal from their landlord um, and vulnerable 
doesn't necessarily mean being part of a particular demographic group. It can be what happens to you at that point in time. So I would be looking carefully at um, getting that lived experience about accessibility, about the support that individuals have to get them through this process, um, what they want to see as a result. We talk about impact, but what do people with lived experience want to see as impact? Um, also, I think time is probably critical in, in a housing um, situation. I, I defer to my um, colleague who's here early, the housing ombudsman. Um, but again, this, this cultural issue, I think, is a really important part of what ombudsman services do. And linking it to governance, whether that's through terms and conditions, but actually, you've got to hold the people who were responsible for the organisation, the leadership, to account, as well as the individuals within it. So some, some practical things. How accessible is it? How do people get to it? Learned lived experience. Because if you don't make it an accessible service, then it doesn't matter how brilliant the Ombuds service is. Great. Thank you. Um, Sandra, any last reflections? <coughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't really need the Ombuds Service at all? If, if the organisations um, that are looked after by the Ombuds Service actually did deal with their complaints and their issues um, immediately <coughs> and to the satisfaction of the consumers, the citizens, the users, whatever words we want to use. But we are here. And to be able to take forward in what I have already said, what I think could be a very exciting way and a very progressive way, um, the Ombuds Service um, for our population. I think we need to have a new service. I think whether it's like the Dutch service, I don't know. For any of you that haven't worked out, is that my name is Dutch. <laughs> I'm married to a Dutchman, so I know what some of the services can be like. <coughs> um, but it's good. It is good. And if we can mirror something that is best pra practice and is fit for purpose, not only for today, but for the future, um, I think we need to put as much pressure on those that make the decisions to enable this to happen. Patrick. Yeah, as long as we have structure of equality, race and discrimination, we'll still need a service. That's a reality. Um, I think there's too much emphasis on rewarding failure than rewarding achievement. Um, and I think the third point to, to add um, regarding moving forward, what we need to do is I think it's important that Inclusion has to be the heart of the agenda of any new service. If you combine all of them together, inclusion has to be driven by that. I think that's really, if we, without that inclusion agenda, then we'll just simply reinforce the existing power structures, uh, and that's why people don't, don't engage. And, so, and I think there's opportunity. It just requires some cross-political consensus. Why did, it, why did not the bill... Uh, Rob, get passed in 2016, 2017. What, what was the barriers to that? Was it because there was less, there was no, there was lack of inertia in Parliament at the time? We need to change that. How do we engage the public to have a public debate? And, and, the, and it has to be linked to our human rights. We're still British subjects, but maybe it should be linked to our rights. If you complain, we should have the rights also. The, about 10 years ago, everyone talked about the NHS constitution. We don't talk about it anymore. And that was like enshrined rights but we should maybe have a conversation around rights and complaints at the same time. Thank you. Um, we're, we're overrunning, but Rob, the, the final word. Thank you. First of all, private practice and public sector practice, there has to be a conversation about it. Uh, Donald Gallagher is chief executive <coughs> of the Ombudsman Association. That is a perfect forum for that discussion. It does happen. We need to make sure that it gets people know where to go for that. Secondly, just coming back to your point, Tony, about uh, leadership, that you mentioned the Nolan rules. The Nolan rules, or somebody mentioned the Nolan rules. Okay. It was me. There is no definition. 
Leadership is one of the principles of public life. There is no definition of it whatsoever in, in the Nolan Rules. It's the least defined and the most difficult to achieve. And I, I'd like to end up on this point about culture. You know, we've heard a great deal of praise for the Dutch scheme, and uh, that's absolutely right. I just want to tell you that it's all about cultural relativity as well. The Dutch ombudsman said to me, the only problem about you, Rob, is that you don't have a chauffeur. And if you had a chauffeur, you could be much more effective. Now, can you imagine what that would do for our reputation? So, you know, we have to take these things uh, very carefully. But, but my very last point is, um, in 2020, we laid before Parliament uh, a two-year research study of what leadership looked like in the public sector and in the health service. And what we found when we, we looked and, uh, and really dug into it was that too many leaders in the health service and in public services, they cut off their complaints team when things got difficult. They didn't give them the necessary training that they needed in order to do their job properly. And they, they didn't see them as, they didn't see their role as leaders in giving them the power that they needed to confront the hierarchies in their organization. Until that changes, yes, I agree absolutely, sir, that terms and conditions are absolutely right. But if you have that cultural block, that's not going to be as important as it would be if they understood leadership in its widest sense. But we have to practice what we preach. If we don't do it, why should other people do it? Many thanks, Rob. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we've got to stop there. There's so much more clearly uh, that we could be discussing, and this is a really uh, important area, but we, we have run out of time. Uh, my apologies to many of the questions online that I didn't get to. Um, for those of you in the room, do feel free to continue the conversation over refreshments outside on the landing. Um, our thanks again to our sponsors for this event, the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. And please do join us for our next event, which is this evening at 5.45, entitled Better Budgets, Has Tax Policy Making Improved? There's still time to register for that online <laughs> if you would like to. Um, so finally, thank you all very much for coming today. And please join me in thanking our panel, Rob Behrens, Rosemary Agnew, Patrick Vernon, Sanja Verkuyten and Sir Bernard Jenkins.